PHLY Eagles podcast on a Monday, high noon, Bo Wolf, Zach Berman. And if you're watching live, you already know, in the middle, sandwiched between us, Fran Duffy of PhiladelphiaEagles.com and the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast. Fran, how you doing? Doing great. We get to sit and talk some football today. It was uh, a big weekend. I'm excited to, uh, to chop it up with you guys today. Now, we're going to get to draft talk. Yes. We're going to get there in the next couple weeks, but you know, not today. <laughs> uh, no, this is, a, this is a very football-focused episode. We are narrowing in as we, as we are just over two weeks away from the draft. We're going to go position by position over the next 10 episodes. Mm-hmm. Zach, what are you smiling at? I'm so excited for this. Uh-huh. I was actually, I was saying this this, this weekend. Big week of shows coming up. Mm. And when is school. it not, though? Well, yeah, but these ones here, we're, we're narrowing in on the draft here. We, we can't keep pushing it back. We're, we're getting into the nitty-gritty of these players. Um, and what's cool about this is we got the day one guys. The day, we're even talking day three. You're getting everything here. And, and what better way two. to start than offensive talk? Yeah, well, obviously. Okay. I mean, if I if we're not skipping day two. We're, well, I'm just saying. Yeah. You, know, you said day one and day three. Yeah. We're going to so talk day two as well. Uh, today's tackle. We're talking offensive tackle. So we're going to start with sort of a big picture conversation because it does seem like this is a polarizing possibility for the Eagles. You know, if Lane Johnson's going to play for two or three more years, would you really use a 22nd overall pick or a first round pick on a position where a guy might not have an immediate path to playing time? We will unpack that. We're going to talk this specific class where there is a deep group of first round caliber players. And then that means that the guys who might otherwise be day two guys get pushed down a little bit. This could be a deeper draft. We're going to talk about that. But for those of you who want the nonsense and like don't really want to talk football, there's a separate channel. If you go to YouTube, there's, we've got a feed of just Fran's thighs under the <laughs> desk. And that's how you can follow that. Very esoteric of you. Yes. yes. Obviously. Uh, and Zach's, of course, you know, willing to feed the beast. He'll he'll be nude as well. So, so <laughs> no, that's, good. that's not true at all. I'm not putting that out there at all. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's. Here's 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 where I want to talk. Where I want to start. Um, I want to compare tackle and corner because I, I feel like those are what seem like the two most likely positions for the Eagles in the first round. And I want to sort of make the case for why tackle is not a waste. Okay. Now, and I, I understand the urgency that you want a guy who's going to contribute to a Super Bowl caliber team right away. But if we accept the premise that the Eagles want to eventually replace Lane Johnson with a Pro Bowl caliber tackle, where do those guys come from? And, you know, I've done this in the past and looked back at the history of uh, where Pro Bowlers and all pros come from over the past uh, 11 years, 12 years. I did. I went through it all this weekend. There have been 28 tackles who made either the initial Pro Bowl team, so no, no Tyler Huntley's yep. in this example, or an all-pro team over the past 12 years. And for the tackles, two things stand out. Number one, they get drafted early. That seems obvious. It's a position that everybody cares about. But you can make a case that tackle is maybe the most efficient position that the NFL drafts. The median pick for those 28 players is 13th overall. Mm. Of all those 28 players, 13th overall, which is the second highest behind only quarterback. And 18 of those 28 guys were drafted in the first round. Again, second only to quarterback. Only five of them drafted on day two, which is about 18%, which is the second lowest by position to edge. The second thing that stands out is that the elite tackles stay the elite tackles. If you get a guy, you have got a guy. The 28 guys, if you look at just the rate of turnover among the players who are in that sample of of pro bowlers and all pros, it's 71% of the spots are accounted for by the same group of guys, which is the second lowest rate of turnover behind defensive tackle. Now, there are some reasons why that might be. Like, it's sort of a reputation position for for, uh, those awards. But when you've got a tackle, you've got a tackle. Now, compare that to corner, 
where you know we've talked about it's a little bit less sticky. Some of that is, is ball production, but only running back, safety, and tight end have a higher rate of turnover among the elite of, of their positions. And despite the fact that corner is a position that is drafted early, it is the fourth, and you've done this, and you're a draft sicko in this, terms yeah. of the history, yep. uh, Fran, the fourth highest position in terms of like volume of first round picks is corner however if you look at like where the best guys come from it's the second highest rate of day three and undrafted guys so you can get elite corners later almost 30 percent of them come on day three or later and the median pick of those guys is 31 which is right sort of in the middle so i get the urge that a corner has got an immediate path to playing time but if you want to have a pro bowl tackle which I know that the Eagles want to eventually have one, I think you can make a case that at 22 in a year where like some of these guys who would otherwise be a top 15 picks might be there, this is a unique opportunity to get one of those guys. Yeah, and just to also follow up there too, I think when you look at what these guys get paid on the pro market, you know, sure. that's something that has been talked about You know, with positions like tight end, you know, Brock Bowers in particular here. I know last time when we spoke at the Combine, we had that discussion. And when you look at some of the top-rated uh, offensive linemen, offensive tackles from a contract value standpoint, average per year, Laramie Tunsil, $25 million a year, Trent Williams, 23, Andrew Thomas, 23.5, Lane Johnson, 20.2. All those guys were top top half of the first round selections, uh, and all of them are north of 20 million. And some of those guys, 23 million per year on an average uh, per year con uh, contract. Now, when you look at corner, Jair Alexander tops the market at 21. And then you get to Marshawn Lattimore at 19.5, Trayvon Diggs at 19.4, Lejarius Sneed, who just got traded for 19. So it's a tier below that. But what I think is most notable is when you get – this is why I tried to make this point in Indy, and I did not do a good job of sticking this landing. Uh, so I'll try and redo it here. When you go a couple tiers below that, right, so you go not just like top of the market, right. but the low-end starter. So if you just look from a, a contract standpoint, Austin Jackson, former first-round pick by the Miami Dolphins, um, $12 million a year. Uh, Charles Leno from Washington last year, he was at $12 million a year. Rob Havenstein from the Rams, $11.5 million a year. Again, kind of low-end, right. replacement-level starter is kind of how those guys would be viewed. If you go to corner, Rocky Asin, Four million a year. Patrick Peterson, mm -hmm. who's uh, obviously a decorated career potential Hall of Famer, seven million a year. Jeff Akuda, just this past year, top three pick, yeah, four point eight million a year. So we're talking like a third of the value from a contract standpoint. So that's how the, those guys are viewed on the open market. It is harder to find uh, a starting quality offensive tackle, not just a, a pro ball, all pro quality tackle, but uh, even just a low end starter. Those guys are harder to come by and therefore more valuable on the market. And if I can follow up on that, because I. I, I think that's a great point. The The draft is for the next six, eight, ten years, not the next six, eight, ten months. That's the first thing. The second thing is there's this notion that if you draft an offensive tackle, you're keeping him on ice for the next two years, right? Lane Johnson, the last time he played a full season was 2015. Uh, so... And he's not getting younger, right? That's impossible. Right. So, so the idea that, that's real astute observation. That's, 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 that's the research I did this weekend. He's not getting younger. You watched Benjamin Button. Yeah, right. Oh, exactly. this is not a documentary. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> good, that's good reference. So my, my point being that like, there is a, a higher than likely chance that even if Lane Johnson, like, you know, that this, this offensive tackle, even if he doesn't have guard versatility, and he very well might be your starting guard. He'll be pushed into action next year. The Eagles, if you look at their depth chart right now, and I, I know we're, we're going to get to it, but their top backup tackle would be Fred Johnson, potentially Tyler Steen, right? They're, they're, they don't have that, like, experienced swing tackle, and I suppose you can, you can sign one, but if the first-round pick would most likely play next season and could be could have a, a valuable role. And the last thing I'll add is that if you talk to people inside the building – They'll talk about the sustained success that the Eagles had, and the blips on their radar are years when the offensive line went to crap, basically. And so you want to make sure that for both Jordan Mailata and Lane Johnson, you have a, you have someone in there you feel can you, you can start and win games with. And I also think back to, you know, we don't think of it this way anymore because it happened quickly. But remember when they drafted Lane Dickerson? It was like, well, he doesn't have an immediate path to playing time. Exactly. Like, and then, like, Brandon Brooks get hurt, gets hurt and never plays again. Yep. Like, uh the, I think, you know, we had Baldy on on Friday and he said Lane's going to play another two or three years. That's great in theory, but if that doesn't happen, the, you know, they need to be prepared. I also think this framing of this guy's going to have to sit 
it's a little bit like it's really only applying to Tyler Guyton and Amarius Mims and, and maybe Olu Fashionu, right, in the first round. Like the other guys who are in that conversation who we will get to, Fatanu and, and Fuanga and even J.C. Latham, like those guys can play guard. And so it's not, I, you know, I don't love using a first round pick on a guard, but if this guy is also your eventual tackle. This also goes to like the Stoutland conversation of if you have this guy who's a great coach, do you use the resources in the first round to, so he can get guys from good to great, or do you use that power in the middle rounds and get guys from okay to starting caliber? But I think the, the Eagles roster-wise have done a very good job of addressing the depth chart in a way that they should not have to reach yeah. in round one. Like if they don't draft a corner in the first two rounds, they can go play on you know tomorrow and be fine. And so I don't know. Where do you guys fall well, on like the, the use of a first-round pick and a tackle? Well, to your point about the Landon Dickerson example, and that's a good one, I have this seared in my head is Joe Douglas, and he said this a number of times when I've spoken to him about this, is that Ozzie Newsom would say to the scouts in Baltimore that today's luxury is tomorrow's necessity. And that's like the absolute, you know, you can say it's not a need until Brandon Brooks gets hurt, and then it's a need. You can say it's not a need until Lane Johnson gets hurt, and then it's a need. So the point is, take the, take the best player at the best position, and it's, it's going to become a need eventually. And that's what I think it's important to note as well that, you know, I think a lot of people view a draft board and think of just like, a, you know, Mel Kuyper's top 50 yeah. or top 25 and a, a vertical, like, list. That is not how teams operate. It is a, a, a horizontal board where mm -hmm. guys are often placed into buckets. And so if you've got... You know, love some, a bucket. Yeah, love a bucket, <laughs> obviously. Uh, but I think when you're looking at uh, you know a draft board, you say, okay, whether it's a, a term like solid starter, Pro Bowl player, or if it's a number, a lot of people use a number system. Uh, if you have three offensive tackles and one corner and a pass rusher, they're all on the same horizontal layer of that board. They're all going to have the same grade. And that's where you start having these discussions of positional value and are you taking this guy versus that guy. There's also the element of, all right, because then this, by the way, these are the conversations that are being had right now and over the last like week or so is, what if, let's say we want to go in an ideal world, uh, you know, if you're, you're team A and you want a running back, a wide receiver, and a pass rusher in the first three rounds, that would be an ideal scenario. Okay, are we better served having right. a pass rusher, running back, and wide, what, would, what would that look like from a player standpoint? Are we better off having this group of players or that group of players? So, again, if you're just comparing offensive tackle and corner, would you rather have insert – round one offensive tackle and insert round two corner, or would you flip that? What do you feel better about walking away from the draft? And those are the conversations. Well, let's, let's play that game. Yeah. Would you rather have, let's say, let's say Troy Fatanu and who's a, who's a second round corner who, who might be uh, there? A second round corner. Kamari uh, Lester. There you go. Throw, okay. throw Kamari Lester in there. Or, would you, Lester, or yeah. would you rather have uh, Nate Wiggins and Kingsley Suamatea? Yeah. I mean, that's the, I think that, I mean, I was, the, the, the problem with it, and that's what I think is interesting about this class, offensive tackle is typically, to your point that you made earlier, a position that will go earlier than people think. Typically, those mm -hmm. guys are going to go off the board. If you, feel, if you feel like he can be a starting tackle, the guy usually doesn't last. And we do talk the about round. the Eagles like they've got two second-round picks, but they're late They're late second-rounders, you know, yes. The first one's but at 50. second-round picks, yeah. Well, they are second yeah. but I mean, yeah. if, you're, if you're counting on a tackle sure. falling, you can't, like, oh, that's Sumate true, yeah. is probably not going to be there. Yes, no. exactly. And, and we'll get to it. There's a reason why the Eagles haven't really taken offensive tackles in the second and third round for the reason you mentioned. The best ones are, like, it's, it's not like you're, you're usually sitting on the board in round two. And it's like, ooh, we were going to take this guy in round one, and he's still sitting there. Offensive tackles, they get pushed up, not yeah. pushed down. Yeah, uh, and so I think that that's what makes having that discussion hard in a vacuum. Now, in this particular draft class, you know, the same way that hey, you know, the Eagles are sitting at 22, the guy that would be there at 22 is typically not a player that would be sitting there at 22 right. in most years. But because of how val how loaded this class yep. is, and we'll get we can talk through some of these individual players because of how impressive this group is on the whole. Well, now that might lead to a guy falling that normally would not. And I think the same would be said about round two. Now, when you get to like round three, round four, I don't think you'll be able to say that. Those tackles are going to go. Um, but I think when you get to the second round of the draft, there's going to be tackles there. You know, maybe a Roger Rosengarten type that. Who knows? Like if he had come out a year from now, you're talking maybe the, the 25th pick in the draft, something like that. Right. And if he hadn't broken his arm and then all of a sudden he was throwing 95 miles an hour. That's right. Henry Rowan Gardner. Yeah. Roger, yeah, we got it. yeah. Yeah. That's okay. good. One. <laughs> How do you feel, Zach, about, about tackle versus corner? Just your own personal opinion. 
Well, it's nuanced, <laughs> as you can guess. Yeah, I know, well, but, but, it, I mean, it you joke, but that's true. Like, it, depends, it does yes. depend on the player. Like, yeah, you know. exactly. I, I've, I've made the point on, on the show when we spoke about edge rushers, and it was, it was what Fran just said. Like, this is a year when a guy, uh, the top offensive tackle in last year's draft, okay, uh, would be the, what might be like the the fifth offensive tackle this year might be the top offensive tackle in last year's draft. Um, and you've had years where it's not very strong. You've had years when the first 10 picks, 11 picks are defensive guys and offensive tackles are getting pushed down the board. A matter of fact, when the Eagles took Andre Dillard, it was that type of year for the most part at offensive line. Uh, this is a year when I think you're going to get tremendous value. I don't think it's it's too early in the team's trajectory for the reason I, I mentioned. It's a premium position. Howie likes to think ahead. Unless there's a corner who falls or a corner that you love, I think you're much more likely to find a, a, a good corner with starting potential in round two than a good offensive tackle with starting potential in, in round two. So I think you're, I think value is going to meet the – I think the value on the board is going to meet the organizational value in round one. I will lean toward taking offensive tackle – Unless there's a run early and you're you're sitting there and you're pushing for the tackle when there's like an obvious corner on the board. Yeah, uh, and to your point too, obviously all of this comes down to uh, an individual basis as well. Not every team is going to view every single one of these tackles as sure. first round quality players. So uh, you know when you get into a Troy Fautanu mm-hmm. versus a J.C. Latham versus uh, you know versus an Amarius Mims. Some teams are going to view all of three of those players a little bit differently. I was thinking about as as just a thought experiment, like the Andre Dillard pick. Just if you, imagine that Andre Dillard was Jordan Mailata, like you use the first round pick yeah. on Andre Dillard, and he sat for two years and turned into Jordan Mailata. That's a good point. Would you like? Would you think that was a bad pick because he didn't play for two years? No, right? Like he eventually took over and he's playing at a high level, and so. I mean that's it's not it's not as easy as saying that, but you took your shots, you you got a guy. I like the draft to me is about this is this is your chance for talent acquisition, and if you think that this is the best chance to get a Pro Bowl caliber tackle into your building, I am like you know I love Terry and Arnold. I think I'd love to have him. Aside from that, I would rather have one of these tackles. I think. And by the way, there's 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 this kind of this revisionist history that sometimes takes place with the Lane Johnson pick. When the Eagles drafted Lane Johnson, Jason Peters was the left tackle and Ty Harriman's was the right tackle, right? Like, they were fine at, at, at that spot. Um, it wasn't as if they needed yeah, that's a good point. an offensive tackle. But the the it was a strong offensive tackle year there, right? Three of the, of the first four picks were off offensive tackles. Yep. The Eagles moved Harriman's to guard to accommodate Lane Johnson. But the, but the point was, you could have said that that year— why are they taking an offensive tackle? Like you're you're set at, at these two positions. They viewed Lane as the eventual replacement for Jason Peters. That that actually never happened. But if if you have a good player, um, you don't you don't pass on a good player just because your 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 depth chart might not have a glaring hole at that point. And I'll also add in and and again, if they took Justin Jefferson, then I I I wouldn't have said they forced wide receiver. But the point is, the Eagles waited for that draft to address wide receiver. And they took Jalen Rager like to fit a specific role for yeah. that year, and that was a poor way of thinking. So if you're saying, and I, I, I mean, reasonable minds can can disagree, but if you say the Eagles have this Super Bowl caliber roster, they just didn't need an upgrade at, at corner, take the guy who's going to start day one. That that to me is a flawed way of thinking. I agree. All right, uh, before we move on, let's talk about Bet Parks because today we are brought to you by the Bet Parks app. Get in the zone. With the Bet Parks Sportsbook app, money is in the moments. Was watching that uh, women's college basketball championship game yesterday, and I feel like if you were like if you sort of know how these games go, Iowa jumps out to that big lead. You jump on those live odds, like mm-hmm. all of a sudden South Carolina is an underdog to win the game. But come on, you know what you know what you're doing. Do you jump in mid game? Absolutely. Good job, in, Zach. In Dawn, I trust. Done. In Dawn, I uh, trust. And so you worked out. You did that very well. Win big with all day action. Win your first ten dollar bet and earn one hundred and twenty five dollars in sports bonus bets. You play for fun. You love to win, you bet. Download the game, the Bet Parks app, and play along with us. Must be 21 or older. Please gamble responsibly. If you or someone you know has a gambling problem and wants help, call 1 800 Gambler. I was in Wawa yesterday morning, and I'm in kind of like the uh, the fresh food, you know, circle that they have that there, and I see Owie Pop right there. Hey-o. I said, great, great product placement for a great product. Owie Pop is the world's 
First functional soda with a classic soda taste that and it has the benefits of plant-based fiber, prebiotics, and other botanical in- in- ingredients. It's a new kind of soda with only two to five grams of sugar and nine grams of fiber per can. And there, it's available uh, online and in almost thirty thousand retailers nationwide, including, like I said, their most recent launch in the Wawa store. Olipop is, is, you know, there's, if you think about it, two out of three Americans say they suffer from digestive issues and 95% of Americans don't get the daily recommended amount of fiber. Olipop is tackling both of these issues with a drink that tastes just like soda. It only has nine, it has nine grams of prebiotic fiber in every can that helps you support your digestive health. Olipop has delicious, it has delicious nostalgic flavors as well, including vintage cola, classic root beer, so many. Just go into your Wawa and you'll find your the, uh, great Olipop flavors. Use the code PHLY20 for 20% off their ne- uh, uh, of, uh, or I should say 20% off your next order of Olipop. The discount only applies to one-time orders, not to subscription orders. Olipop is sold online, drinkolipop.com and on Amazon, and it's available in almost 30,000 retailers nationwide, including Wawa, Target, Sprouts, Wegmans, ShopRite, and GoPuff. All right, let's pivot from the big picture conversation to the specific players in this draft. And Zach, we've talked about one of the nice things about having a general manager who's been in charge of 12 drafts is we have a larger sample size of like the kinds of things that might matter to him. So you did a little uh, deep dive, look back on the tackles that Howie has drafted to see if there were any common threads. What did you learn? Yeah, it's it's interesting. You you brought this point up a few weeks ago that it's actually not a position that he's he's like heavily indexed in, right? And that that surprised me. Uh, if if you look at it, I'm including Tyler Steen and Jack and Jack Driscoll on this list, but. Uh, going back to when Howie became GM, 2012, Dennis Kelly was the first offensive tackle he took. Then Lane Johnson, Halapuli Vati Vaitai, Jordan Mailata, Matt Pryor, Andre Dillard, Prince Tega Wanogo, Jack Driscoll, and Tyler Steen. Um, Lane Johnson and Andre Dillard were first-round picks. After that, the earliest they took one was Tyler Steen in the third round, and he was announced as a guard. Uh, Jack Driscoll with the fourth round was kind of a tackle guard versatile guy. So most of these have, have been later picks other than, of, of course, Lane Johnson Jack, and Jack Driscoll. All of them have been at least six foot five. That's not surprising. Your taller guys tend to play on the offensive line. Uh, interestingly, Jason Peters would have been like the outlier in right. that group. Most of them, other than Jordan Mailata, who's a big outlier are older players. Okay. You're, you're looking at 23, 24 year old types as opposed to your 21, 22 year old types. Um, all big school guys, of course, except for, for Jordan Mailata. Um, you're looking at Alabama, Auburn, Washington, TCU, Oklahoma, Purdue. You're not looking at any small school guys. Uh, uh, in a lot of these cases, you're looking at long arm players. Lane Johnson, 35 and a quarter inch arm. Halapulivati, 34 and a quarter inch arm. Um, but what jumps out, but but that's not always the case. The the thing that really jumps out is the broad jump. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, Fran's opinion on this. Uh, they, they 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 tend to take players in the higher percentile, like the top 10 percent, top 15 percent in in broad jump. But this is consistent regardless of of round. From Lane Johnson. The Halapuli Vati Vaitai. So if you're taking a fifth round offensive tackle, that's an outlier uh, in the broad jump. It shows that this is something you 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 uh, value, and it, it extends even to someone like Jack Driscoll. Andre Dillard had a had a, a great broad jump. So um, that was interesting to me, and it seems to be of the testing metrics something that they value just when you look at the sample size and where these guys ranked in broad jump. Fran, why might that be? Well, I think the the big thing whenever you're talking about like the draft measurables, maybe it's uh, you know the the famous one was Seattle during the uh, the Legion of Boom days, the the arm length, yeah. right? Uh, sometimes that can be a threshold where it's like, okay, hey, you know what? Like if he doesn't pass 32 inch arms, he's not he's off the board. Uh, I don't know whether or not that's the case with with the broad jump metric that that Zach is uh, referring to, but I think when you're looking at the broad jump, what does it exemplify? It ex- it exemplifies uh, lower body explosiveness, and I think for an off offensive lineman power because those two things are kind of uh you know in lockstep there and real quick i guess that one thing I, i'd love to talk about when you're looking at offensive linemen this is all prospects you're talking let's talk about this with pass rushers as well the difference between strength and power and one way that it's been explained to me in the past by a strength coach and i, I it's stuck with me because it's really a good visual is if you think of water right you think of mm. niagara falls that's uh, p- m- water moving at an extremely high rate and moving moving everything in its path 
that is power, right? But then if you take uh, a glacier, you take an iceberg, okay. that is strong. Nothing is moving a glacier. Nothing mm. is moving an iceberg. That is strength. So there's, there are some guys that are strong but not powerful. There are some guys that are powerful but not strong. You love a guy that can be both. Typically, the guys that are both, that's when you're cooking with gas. That's, okay. that's typically a first-round quality You don't prospect. want a big, strong man. No, you want a big, Or a big... Strong powerful man you want, you a, want a big strong powerful man as we i'm know. just thinking about jim and pan's wedding when you said niagara falls so that's, that's what comes to my mind <laughs> i was wondering why you were smiling over there <laughs> yeah. when he said niagara falls no, i, I didn't know you, what was going through your head of jim and pan's what wedding dirty thing but... Joy, were you thinking the same dirty thing no <laughs> it was jim and pan's wedding it's the most wholesome thing you could think about well and i, know, I two, didn't know that at the time two people who were in love well right? that's why yes. I, did, I did that for zach because it's an office reference but then also you get the non-fiction work of the titanic as well <laughs> <laughs> well done, well done. That's yes. pretty good. Um, but that I, wasn't a documentary, but it yeah, seemed like it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, to me, when you're looking at, at offensive line qualities, you know, powerful, like powerful guys. Those are you're talking about raising the ceiling of a player. Because to me, like if you look at the elite offensive linemen in football, for the most part, those guys are powerful. And typically, also, if you are a day three guy that goes and, and, and has power in your repertoire, uh, typically those guys have a high floor. Like they're going to stick in the league. It's like a receiver or a corner who can run four two or four three. Those guys are going to get chances because they have the ability to move people off the ball. You can see guys get stronger over the course of their career. Lane Johnson, uh, you remember that when he first came into the NFL, he would get bull rushed back into the quarterback's pocket. He, you can you can get stronger uh, in the NFL and hold your anchor a little bit better. Hold up and pass route. It might take some time, but it can get there. Power typically does not uh, get better over the course of a guy's career. Mm. You, you can tweak things. Sometimes there are guys that, you know, they jump out of the gym. There is untapped power that doesn't always show itself on film. Uh, but typically a guy does not get more powerful because you're talking about explosiveness in the body uh, that typically does not improve. Just generally, uh, broad jump versus vertical jump. Mm. Why? Why does it? Why would it show up in one versus the other? Uh, I have asked this question. Um, people say people will def definitely say, "Hey, it shows up in the vertical as well." Okay. But for whatever reason, I don't know if it's just because, like, you know, the vertical. Uh, you know, there are things involved from like the the testing standpoint because you're working that uh, I forget the name of the pole that they use in terms of measuring the, yeah. the vert. Um, but there are other factors at play that where it's like, oh, that can be a little bit wonky. But the broad. Like that, that's the okay. one that people will swear by. The other thing I want to ask you about, because you you know, uh, maybe power is harder to teach than than strength or harder to improve. When you are evaluating guys, like if we're talking about their hand usage or, or yeah. things like that, what is teachable hmm. versus what is like uh, that's a bit of a red flag. I don't know if he can fix that. Pretty much all the hand stuff is teachable. Okay. Like any almost all that stuff and now it re requires a player to be coachable. Sure. Right? So you you hope that that is the case, but uh all of that stuff and that's why honestly a lot of scouts like, you know, it's not necessarily important for them to know like all the technical inner workings of positions because uh you know, in theory It's about like the body types. Yes, the, exactly. Okay. It's about the physical traits. And so uh if you see, you know what, uh, this guy and we'll say like a uh, a Tyler Guyton for instance from Oklahoma uh, this guy is a uh, 6'7", 324 pounds, former tight end who grew into his body and is extremely athletic on film. And the power and the strength are all there. Like all the traits are there. The technique's a little bit inconsistent. Kingsley Suomataia from BYU, hmm. same kind of deal where, you know what, the, all the traits are there. The technique's a little bit up and down, but like if you if you can coach him up, wow! Like everything, Amarius Mims from Georgia, same kind of idea where it's not all pretty. He's only got eight starts under his belt in the SEC, but if you can coach him up to say like, okay, if you, now it's about doing it repeatedly, down after down. Now you're 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 cooking with something there, and that's why those kind of guys are going to catch uh, a lot of eyes over the course of the the draft process. All right, let's let's sort of bang through these seven guys who are either at at 22 yeah. or higher. I think we can sort of push Joe Alt to the side because it seems like he'll be out of the conversation. You know, the Eagles aren't going to go up that high. So the next six guys, let's let's start with the guy who we didn't really touch about uh, touch on as much last week. The best broad jump of them all, Troy Fautanu, and there's that you know there's that meme of. Jeff Stoutland sort of like looking at him, moving at, at the combine. Um, when I watch these guys, just like looking at the way they move, he was my favorite. I mean, that doesn't mean anything, but just I, that I like means something. He, Give he's, yourself credit. He's very, You're like, an astute the observer. The way he moves. You know? uh, tell me about Fatano. And, and also, 
this is a guy who could potentially play guard, right? Yeah, uh, an astute observer, not just yeah. a practical, like offensive line. Yes, player. exactly. I mean, the, yeah. the, the proof is in the pudding. Yeah, there. yeah. He's not overwatching seven on seven. He's watching one on one all day. Yeah. Uh, here's what I'll say about Troy Falatano: the uh, the play speed, the, the the explosiveness, the twitch off the ball. I would say is probably the most impressive of this entire offensive line group. And so it was not shocking to see him look so good in Indianapolis at the combine because when you watch him on film. His ability to just get out of his stance and go is as impressive as anybody. And a lot of people will say that that is as important of any trait in, uh, in the offensive line. Get off of get out of your stance and get to your spot. Pass protection, run blocking, the whole deal. Uh, he's got outstanding movement skills, great range, some outstanding highlight blocks uh, in space. You watch him in the screen game. Uh, some really, really fun plays from that standpoint. But then also with Faotanu, uh, it's the, the the toughness aspect is impressive. He's played both left tackle and left guard. Some people feel like he could play center. Uh, I know he's done some work in the pre-draft process on the right side. He's never done it in the game, but uh, that present potential five position flexibility is really, really important for him moving forward. Uh, technically sound, this is a guy that is really well uh, has been really well coached in the past. To be honest, like anywhere from like 10 until, you know, 18, 19, 20. I know he's been very uh, commonly mocked to Seattle uh, just because the, the coaching staff connection there. They hired the offensive mm -hmm. coordinator and the O-line coach from Washington there with the Seahawks. So uh, it seems like that might be the floor in terms of where he could get drafted. But uh, Seattle has been one of the more harder predict teams to predict in the NFL draft. Now, I should say that he's a little bit shorter than the, the yes. uh, relative term the threshold that, that you there, talked yeah. about for the Eagles. <laughs> he's, he's under 6'4". But 34 and a half inch arms. Yes. Right, so which he's is short, like 67 percentile. Yes, right. exactly. Um, what do you what do you what do you make of the the young man from Washington? Although not as young, will be twenty four as yeah, a rookie. Yeah, don't uh, look. I'm I'm not as high on him as the two of you are, uh, and I'll I'll defer to you guys. We'll get to some of the others that are kind of more my type. Um, I wonder. I don't want to say maxed out, but like you're talking about someone who really needed to develop when he was at Washington. He he, he wasn't an early starter there. He was he was a, a redshirt guy who was reserve who was like a part time starter and works his way up to being one of the top offensive tackles in the country last year, uh, was a left tackle for one year, I, I believe, at Washington. You're not talking about, you know, some of these guys. And, and again, it might be my bias to, like, you know, top recruits or, like, day one starters. But it wasn't like this this, this no-question talent. It was, it was the type of thing where you wonder if developmentally – what you're getting on on day one is the player you're getting on 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 year five, right? Whereas I tend to lean more towards some of these, you know, quote unquote upside guys. Yeah, I mean, and if he is a guard, you know, I don't love using a first round pick on a on a guard who's going to be 24 as a rookie. That yeah. you know, that that's not my kind of well, Watkins value right? resource. Yeah, I mean, not quite. Not it's quite, not but <laughs> as on its face absurd yeah. as that. But yeah. So anyway, uh, let's let's keep moving down the list here. Uh, J.C. Latham, yep. who we did talk about, about last week. The opposite of that is going to be 21 as a rookie. Um, I, just like my first gut, like I didn't love the way he, he's moving. Like mm. he's a little bit sort of uh, like clunky. But, uh, I mean, the profile is great. Tell me more about J.C. Latham, Frank. Well, you're talking about like a 25 to 30-pound difference uh, between sure. Faotanu and Latham. So uh, that, that would be the, that would uh, account for some of the clunkiness uh, that you were referring to. Okay. Uh, some people do think he'd be better at guard uh, than at tackle. He has played both. He began his career as a guard at Alabama when he first got there in 2021. Uh, one thing that stands about, about Latham, he is both strong and powerful. So okay. when guys get into his chest and try and bull rush him back, it is a futile effort. He is not going to get moved off of his spot. And Alabama's offensive line, I know, Zach, you watch uh, a lot of college football. You watch those playoff games uh, with Alabama over the last couple of years. His ability to come off the ball and move people is as impressive as anybody in this class. So, uh, yeah, like he's tough and physical. He brings that tone-setting demeanor. But – that shows up on film in terms of his ability to move SEC defensive linemen against their will. When everybody else knows they're going to run the ball, he's got the ability to move guys off their spot. That's what is really impressive to me about J.C. Latham is, is that power element to his game. Yeah, he, he strikes me as someone who could start at right guard for you day one um, and then play right tackle. Uh, when, Poor Tyler Steen gets <laughs> well, he was position actually, cucked by his former teammate. Yeah, he was, he was the other side. Uh, and, yeah, young but just, just huge, like really productive and he's he's the guy who if if he's there at 22 
I think it's a really strong pick. We talked about him last week as a trade-up candidate, but he's a day one contributor who has year three, year four Pro Bowl upside. It's a it's a good profile. It's Number one offensive lineman in the country. As yep. a, so Zach, mm-hmm. uh, we know he likes that. Okay, let's uh, let's keep moving up. The other guy, the last guy who is a potential guard fit, and that's uh, Talise Fuanga. Yes, uh, who does seem like you know Jeremiah loves this guy, mm-hmm. Daniel Jeremiah. This like, he wants him to go top ten. Yeah. I don't know if the league will agree with that. Give us the book on Fuanga. Fuanga's a two-year starter at Oregon State uh, at right tackle. Uh, he has, I believe, played – no, he has not played any guard in a game, so he's only been a right tackle. But a lot of people do feel like he can slide inside the guard. He's got that mentality in terms of the way he plays. Uh, the body type may speak more to offensive guard as well, just shot, just north of 33-inch arms. So that's about the threshold that some teams have for offensive Just under 6'6", 324. Yeah, 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 so built more like a guard. But uh, I, to me, I think he does, does have that ability to play offensive tackle in the league. It, probably more on the right side um, just in terms of what his experience has been. But uh, again, you're talking about another player who is both strong and powerful. So the Pac-12 uh, pass rushers had a lot of trouble moving through him, uh, but then also he really created a lot of movement as a uh, as a run blocker as well. He is regarded as probably the best run blocker uh, in this class. Uh, excellent in the screen game and on the move, but uh, it's not just all like on power, watch him move guys against their will. Zone run game, he is really re- uh, well refined and also can move people on his own, like I mentioned. So uh, I think he is scheme versatile in that way. It'll just be a matter of like the position versatility, how you view him. Him, uh, in a vacuum moving forward, but uh, I think he's certainly one of the one of the more high floor players in this offensive line group. I'm curious your thoughts on. Him. I also want to point out we have a super chat up up there as, as well. Oh, uh, a very generous one. Yeah, a Brazilian sicko. Love your work, guys. Uh, turkeys to the kingdom. Eagles not drafting offensive line with at least one of their first three draft picks. I I actually kind of feel like if they don't draft one in the first, I'm not so sure that they're gonna. I don't mm-hmm. think that they need to draft one in the second with mm. either of those two picks. And so I would say I would put, uh, I'd put 40 turkeys on that. Yeah. Yeah. 35. I would say. I mean, when, when's the last time they didn't spend a day one or day two p- choice on an offensive lineman? It's been a handful of years. Well, yeah, right? but those guys are still here. Yeah. So that's yeah, uh, 2020 Jalen Rager, Jalen yeah, Hurts. That would be the last one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, see, that's, that's, a, that's a good one. That's a, I, yeah, and, and, and Davion Taylor was the other. Yes, yes. The other one. Yep. I yeah. just I you know we talked about how deep the class is, but I don't know I don't know if you need uh, to me that the the appeal of the position is that this is your chance in the first round to get yeah. a guy. I don't think that it's a it is a striking need that if you don't get him in the first, you got to make sure you get one in the mm-hmm. second. I think you can take a guy on you can take two guys on day three. So your view on Fuaga because I'll I'll talk more on on Mims when he comes up. Yeah, I, I mean, I I, th- I saw the powerfulness. Uh, yeah. I like I, I like the the nastiness in the run game. I, he didn't seem like a special athlete to me, mm. um, but I'm not. I, you know, I didn't. I, I haven't crushed, you know, eight games of all twenty two. So. Uh, one interesting Eagles note with him, uh, just speaking with him at the Combine, uh, he, you know, a lot of guys will get asked, oh, like, who do you talk with in the league? And Oregon State hasn't been, like, a huge NFL pipeline. He said, I don't really talk to anybody in the NFL, uh, really at all. The only person would be uh, Isaac Samalo, yeah. uh, and obviously a former Oregon State alum. Yeah. Uh, and so they they have had a, a close relationship. Isaac's gone back to campus, and they've, they've kept in touch over the years. It's been a real page turner, that conversation. I was going <laughs> to say, I mean, this must be, what kind of conversations yeah. those must be. Very interesting. Um, all right. I, I don't know that we need to spend a too much time on Olu Fashanu. Yes. Fashanu. Uh, Fashanu. Yes. Fashanu, I believe, as, as uh, Daniel Gallen told us. Uh, but I do want to ask you, do you care about small hands? Uh, only if it shows up on film as an issue. That's how I feel about all of that stuff. Okay. You know, whether it's a quarterback small hands or a corner's long arm or short arms, uh, you know, a defensive lineman short arms. If it shows up as an issue on film, then that's a problem because if it was an issue in college and it'll continue being an issue, it's not. It's only going to get harder. Uh, so if if Olu has figured out how to you know, uh, work a block with eight and a half inch hands, then I think he'll continue that. Dan P in the chat said said earlier. Uh, hopefully ZB doesn't Google teachable hand stuff, which is what uh, <laughs> Fran mentioned earlier, which speaks to draft talk and sometimes, yes. uh, yeah, draft draft jargon is. You know what uh, they say about guys with small hands, Zach? What do they say? Small gloves. Ah, there yeah. you go. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Why don't you tell us about Amarius Mims from Georgia? Well, Big man. I mean, you're talking about 
<laughs> you're talking about a big man here, okay. Marius Mims, who only has eight, eight career starts at, at Almost Georgia. Almost six eight, yeah, three forty, thirty six and one eighth inch arms, which are very long. I mean, you're you're talking about when you when you when the Eagles drafted Jordan Mailata, there was this talk like mold, you know, clay to mold, right? Similar concept with Marius Mims in that eight. Now he has he has eight starts, including he he played in the college football playoffs, right? Um, but you're talking about a young guy who who physically is there. There's a you know he can move well for his size. The combine showed up, but when you watch the game, there's a game. I think it was Georgia Tech, and he's he's running down the right sideline on a screen, and like a six eight, three hundred and forty pound guy or whatever it may be shouldn't be moving like that. Um, has has the long arms and like just he. I mean, I mean to me, he 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 has tools to be a franchise offensive tackle. Uh, and it might require patience, which the Eagles have. But I just, if if you want to swing for the fence, and I like swinging for the fence in the first round, Marius Mims is, is your home run swing. You know, when I watched him in the summer, in August, uh, the first player I thought of was Jordan Mailata. Uh, and it was, if Jordan, if Jordan Mailata, when he came up from Australia, he entered the International Pathway Program, you know, he was doing the deal down at IMG Academy. If he had decided, you know what, instead of going right into the NFL, I'm going to go to college. I, I know there, there have been teams that uh, had tried to talk to him in terms of going that route. If he had done this and you know kind of followed this path, this is the way we would have talked about Jordan Mailata if he had come out uh, as a, a two-year player in college. You know, he, look, Amarius Mims played in 30 games, uh, eight starts. When he got the, he had an ankle injury back in I want to say it was late September, early October. Uh, ended up getting tightrope surgery, and I thought, all right, he's going to go on the shelf. There's no way he's going to come back, come out uh, after the season. Well, he came back to play at the end of the year, which is surprising. And uh, honestly, kudos to him for for getting out and coming back to play. Um, and then he said he's going to declare for the draft. I was shocked because you typically don't see this position with this small sample size drafted that high. It is very, very rare for an offensive lineman with eight starts with under 900 snaps played at the collegiate level to get drafted, period, much less in the first three rounds or much less in the top 20 picks. So uh, just a, a, he is an outlier from that sense. That said, I mean, like Jordan, he is so well put together. The, the height, weight, athleticism, uh, the length, the power, the strength, literally all the physical traits you talk about in wanting an offensive lineman Marius Mims has it, uh, and so he's I, a guy who did who did a, well in the broad, but not well in the vertical jump. Yes, and so that was a, kind of a weird outlier there, uh, into, from that standpoint. Because typically, guys, you know, do well even if you right. like, if you're 90th percentile in the, in the broad, you'll be like 80th percentile in the yeah, vertical. Yeah. It's a bad one, but uh, it was he kind of had a weird one there. But uh, I again, I do think people prioritize the broad a little bit more uh, than the vertical. <laughs> there's, um, there's a uh, an episode of Survivor this season, okay, where this woman like does not know how to jump. Mm. Like she's like practicing. Just know how be, oh, being no. able to jump. Yeah, I had the same reaction. Yeah. Like what is? It? And then they showed a clip of it, and it was one of the funniest things <laughs> I've ever seen. Like she literally could not yeah. figure out how to jump. Amarius Mims, nineteenth percentile yeah. vertical jump, eighty fifth percentile broad jump. I don't, he just can't jump up. I don't no. Know. I also want to add add to because the the Georgia thing keeps uh, keeps coming up. I don't know if like the Eagles are are like married to this idea of of like only taking Georgia guys. Um, you know, they, there's they certainly know the program. They they know the pluses and minuses of it. Now, one thing to point out is that they've they've uh, they've taken defensive guys from Georgia. So maybe there's there's a, a difference there. They they obviously Dom DeSandro has a good sense of the off the field like personality and and, and, and kind of what what goes on at, at, at Georgia. Um, but I, I I will also say like the reason why the Eagles take players from from Georgia is Georgia gets the best players, right? If you just look at the recruiting classes of, the, of the, from the last five years, Georgia cleans up. So Amarius Mims like fits that in in that um, it's it's not like the Eagles are, are saying we only want to take players from Georgia. They're saying we want to take like the best play. You know, Georgia has guys who are physically. Uh, you know, I'm mean, Kirby Smart has a, has a type. They don't have a lot of like you know five ten, one hundred eighty pound guys there. Like they have like you know guys who who are five stars for a reason. Yeah, but I sort of do. It does make me a little skeptical. Not okay. that like you shouldn't draft a Marius Mims because yeah. he came from Georgia, but like if it if it continues along this like path line yeah. of this like convenient narrative, like oh like we're so much smarter than the rest of the league, we can. They, the, the rest of the league didn't consider drafting guys from Georgia. Look how well it worked out. Well, first of all, it hasn't worked out yeah, that great sure. yeah. for, for some of those guys. And I just, I don't, it's it's not a re, it's not a logical reason for me to dislike Emerius Mims, but I'm a little bit. 
if they drafted him in the first round and then they start pounding out like Georgia, the Philadelphia yeah. Bulldogs, I'm like, okay, let's. Well, let's well, get the to guys. your point, I, I mean, they've they they drafted four here, and of those four, there's only one who I would say like with with complete confidence is going to be a starter for them two three years from now, right? right. Um, other than that, there's there's question marks all 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 across the board. And Mims is. Like this is a guy who is is going to be drafted and is going to have to sit. Yeah. Like he is not going to play guard. He is only going to be available if Lane Johnson gets hurt, and it is an investment. Um, I, you know what? He. I feel like the hope with him is Orlando Brown. That's the guy who. Yeah. See, hmm. I think he's more athletic, man. Really? Uh, yeah. He is. He's a really impressive athlete for that side. That's why I compare it to Jordan. Like I he's told not you we were at breakfast. Unfortunately, the name I wrote down was was like a little better than King Dunlap. No, see, I, he's he's a look. He's not going to be confused with Troy Fautanu from an athletic standpoint. But again, at, at six seven, three hundred forty yeah. pounds, uh, there, there aren't a lot of people that move that way. Okay, the other guy uh, and the last guy we'll talk about in this in this group who is another tackle only guy is Tyler Guyton from Oklahoma. Eagles spent some time with him at the Senior Bowl. Now, he fits the thing that we talked about last week, Zach, where he's a little bit older and is yep. still projectable. He's going to be 23 as a rookie. Probably a bit of a red flag that he didn't like play earlier. I mean, he was at TCU. He was at Oklahoma for two years and didn't really lock down a job until this year. But like watching him, like I see it with him much more. Like He is really athletic in space. He goes and gets guys. Um, and it's kind of like an interesting body type, but I liked him at the Senior Bowl too. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of in on him, but I don't know if – I would use 22 on him. Yeah, in, in TCU in 2021, so that he's only been in Oklahoma the last two years, uh, he was kind of like a part-time, he was like a blocking tight end essentially for them and a kind of a movable piece that way. Uh, didn't really move full-time to the offensive line until he arrived at Oklahoma two years ago. So uh, in 2022, his first year on campus, uh, that's when uh, he backed up two draft picks last year uh, that honestly, he's a better prospect than both of those guys. Mm. So when he moved to the offensive line, he said, all right, you know what, you're going you're gonna to kind of uh, take your time here he ended up starting five of ten games, one at left tackle, four at right tackle. So you love the proven versatility there. Ended up starting nine of ten games played this past year at right tackle. Definitely not a finished product, but you know you see the athleticism, you see the power, uh, you see some strength, as we alluded to earlier. I think he's a little bit more powerful than strong at this point. He does need to get a little bit uh, uh, better in terms of taking on bull rushes, but um, this is a guy who's a really rangy run blocker. He's got the feet and pass protection. Things to clean up, but certainly traits there to develop. Yeah, like him. Uh, don't love him, but certainly wouldn't knock the pick. Would ideally be like a trade down situation. Uh, although I can certainly justify there at twenty two. Um, you would have to weigh, I think, the age thing, the, de- the development curve uh, to a, to a, a certain respect. I mean, there's so many good offensive tackles like Kingsley like that you mentioned who are in that twenty one year old range. Where you say what's like physically, what's their body going to be two years from now? What's their development going to be two years from now? That if you're taking a 23 year old, you tend to want them to be like ready to play day one. Uh, now that that's not always the case, but if you feel Tyler Guyton can play day one, then yeah, certainly go ahead. People have made the comparison to Lane Johnson, obviously because the the story is yeah. somewhat similar in terms of coming to Oklahoma, late bloomer, you know, converted offensive lineman. Uh, it should be noted, like Lane went to the off to the Senior Bowl, was one of the best players yeah. in Mobile that week, was outstanding, and then went to the Combine and blew up the Combine. Guyton had a, a good day, like his RAS, his relative athletic score, uh, according to Math Bomb uh, on Twitter, uh, nine point six two. It's a good score. It would they would c- characterize that as an elite athlete. Uh, that's a good number compared to offensive lineman, um, but you know. Th- Again, not like blowing the doors off of the pre-draft process that way. Yeah, I mean, you're hoping that with him, like a lot changes over the years. But one thing that doesn't change over Ooh, the years good transition. is the great taste of Miller Lite. It was the original light beer, and to this day, it is still the best one. Miller Lite has more of the taste you want and less of the stuff you don't. When you are sitting around with the girls tonight watching UConn, Purdue, and you're debating who the Eagles should draft in the first round, you're going to want to have a nice ice-cold Miller Lite in your hand. You know that you do because Miller Lite keeps it simple, undebatable quality, great taste, only 96 calories. It's the beer that strips away everything you don't need and holds on to what matters most, a light beer that tastes like beer, less filling, and only 96 calories, the original light beer since 1975. Times change, but you can always enjoy the great taste of the Miller Lite. Tastes like Miller time. To get Miller Lite delivered right to your door, visit MillerLite.com slash P-H-L-Y birds, or you can find it pretty much anywhere that sells beer. Celebrate responsibly. Miller Brewing Company, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 96 calories 
per 12 ounces, bottoms up. One of the fun teams to watch in baseball this year has been the Pirates. If you want to see the Pirates in person when they come to Philly, they're coming this weekend, and it's your last chance to use Game Time's opening day offer. Uh, Game Time is now an authorized ticket marketplace in Major League Baseball, which makes which makes getting tickets even faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it is to the first pitch. They have killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seats, and the lowest price guarantee. So Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets. And I mentioned this deal that they have. This is the time to do it. Yeah, I mean, go, it's going to be a beautiful weekend. See the Phillies and, and the Pirates. You can wait till, till the last minute. You can take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time for a limited time. All users can get $20 off any MLB purchase of $150 or more in the game time app with code FIRSTPITCH. Terms apply. That's code F-I-R-S-T-P-I-T-C-H for $20 off from March 25th to April 14th, so through this weekend only. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, Zach. Uh, you know we've got we've got Fran here. We want to make the use of it. Yeah, we can go a little longer if it's okay. Uh, we go a little longer. Yeah, we're gonna yeah. pound through some uh, day two, day three yes. options. You and I have both come up with some guys we think yeah. either, whether maybe fits for the Eagles or we sure. like them. You want to go first? Yeah, I, I will go first. Um, and my often my my day two offensive tackle is Blake Fisher. Uh, and I'm curious what you, what you guys think here. Blake Fisher's the right tackle for for Notre Dame. Interestingly, he arrived to be like the left tackle as a true freshman. He got hurt. Joe Alt comes in, right? But Blake Fisher, to me, I mean, you're talking about young developmentally, but he 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 has, the way I see it, tools to be a starting offensive tackle. I actually think he can play guard early on, just in terms of the of the, of the skill set. Uh, but like the playing profile, like the athletic profile, good broad jump, um, like the size profile. Uh, former big time recruit, and I I look at, at at Blake Fisher. If if you're not taking a guy round one, you want to take a swing round two on someone who has legitimate like playing experience, and so not a project in terms of like you've seen him play uh, and can can fit in terms of that that right tackle potential right guard, but still has a lot of upside. You can argue Blake Fisher has has like football tools that Joe Alt doesn't. Um, so I'm going Blake Fisher. Yeah, I mean, Fisher, I think, checks a lot of boxes, certainly from the physical trait standpoint that you mentioned. Uh, he'll check the box from an athleticism standpoint. I think the, the play strength is solid. He can get bumped off track a little bit. I don't think he's a, a power player right now, but uh, I think when you look at his ability to, to get out in space and he can protect the corner, uh, all of that is good. Uh, the technical aspects of the game, I think, are areas where he can get a little bit inconsistent, uh, and that has led to up and down play on the field. I know he got benched at one point this year after giving up a sack. Um, um, you know, he's, he's had some issues with that in the past. That said, there are some people, there are some scouts around the NFL that are pretty high on him. So uh, he's got some fans. We'll see how high he ends up going. But uh, I do think day two, you know, to, you know, late round two, early round three, that's probably the earliest we'll hear for, for Blake Fisher. Danilo Carvalho says we did eight out of ten on the pronunciation. Hopefully I got up to nine on that one. Uh, thank you for the super chat. Um, my guy is the guy we already talked about, Roger Rosengarten, the right tackle from Washington. A little bit undersized, just under 6'6", six, six, uh, 308. Guard versatility, 22 in June. I kind of like I kind of like what I saw from uh, R squared. Yeah, uh, he's a guy that has some power traits to him, uh, but it's just not there consistently. And I think as he continues to get bigger, you would say, okay, that, that power might come along with it. Uh, really, the feet are outstanding. He's he's a light footed player. I thought he had a solid mm -hmm. week down in Mobile. So uh, Rex Ryan's gonna like him. Oh well, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll let you go. Uh, <laughs> I'll on that. Uh, I think that like that Blake most Fisher, men like to do a lot of things with those feet. <laughs> uh, like like Fisher, uh, I think. There are some technique things that can get worked out, uh, but that again, those are things that, that can improve moving to the NFL. Um, you know, uh, the, if you if you are big, and I know the person to my right is not big into these numbers, but if you are one that tracks some of the statistical services, like a Pro Football Focus, was never credited with a sack over the course of his career. Started 28 games, a little bit more than Blake Fisher, and was never credited with a sack. Now, uh, part of that is Michael Penix uh, was very very good at not taking sacks and not taking those plays. I think that's yeah, that's I'm, I'm more willing to trust that than you know uh, you know. Coverage rate, sure, There's some nonsense like that. Um, well, but, but Rosengarten has been a very productive player. The traits are there. He is the classic player that uh, I think will be viewed. You know, whenever he when he does get drafted, and the the GM or the head coach, you know, whoever speaks afterwards, will say if he had gone back for another year, he would have been a first round pick a year from now. The I Joe think that, Kruger, yeah, I think Joe Rosengarten. I think is no. one of those guys. Okay, all right. Who you got in day uh, day three, Zach? 
Day three, I'm going Walter Rouse. Okay, mm. Walter Rouse from from Oklahoma. Uh, you're talking about someone, and he transferred from Stanford. Stanford, yep. 52 career starts, right? Yes. And I and I was talking to Fran about this in there. There's there's sometimes this idea that like on you know you're trying to get starters with every pick. Sometimes when you're talking about day three, if you get like a a good solid swing tackle. That's you get Jack Driscoll is a yeah, fine fourth round. That's yeah. that's really good value. And Walter Rouse is, is someone who I think can can be. Now he always starts. You know, fifty two starts came at, at left tackle, um, but he he can be that reserve tackle for you. He's done it at a at a high level. He's the one who kept Tyler Guyton on the right side. He was the starting left tackle at at, at Oklahoma. He was in like a day one starter at Stanford. Um, and you know, those are two schools that produce high level offensive linemen. Um, he he has you know. The necessary size, terrific arm length, uh, and then off the field, you're talking about intangibles. Like this is a guy who who checks every box. Uh, from, I mean, from DC. How do you know? Okay. Huh. okay, he was he was an Eagle Scout. He was I think he was a biomedical engineering major at uh, Stanford. Um, he worked at the Perlman um, uh, uh, the Perlman Hospital here at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, like just pristine off the you know in terms of uh, some of these intangibles off the, off the, off the field jumps off the screen there. Give so me a break. The kind of, <laughs> <laughs> I think that from a football perspective, 52 starts at left tackle at Stanford and and. In Oklahoma fits the size criteria like you you wouldn't say he's spectacular but has been really solid and then off the field I like everything uh that I've, I've, I've heard about and have great respect for everyone at the Perlman Institute at University of Pennsylvania his best season came this year uh in terms of like a again getting back to some of those production metrics like if you look just solely at that his best year was this year at Oklahoma uh and it was his fifth year like a true fifth year player so uh he is one of the re the super seniors that we've seen over the course of the last couple seasons after every collegiate athlete got that extra year of eligibility from the NCAA due to COVID-19 uh we're going to be running out of those here in a couple mm -hmm. years and so I'll be interested to see that the sample size of those players and there there are a handful in this draft but that got that extra year. Darius Robinson comes to mind this year from Missouri, where you know if COVID nineteen never happened, mm. right, uh, and he Eagles came out last Super year, Bowl. right, well, yeah, uh, <laughs> he uh, if, if that had never happened, uh, Darius Robinson, the pass rusher from Missouri, comes out in the NFL draft and is probably a late day three pick uh, based off traits. He had like four career sacks or something like that up to that point. Goes back for that extra year and was lights out, and now he's being talked about in the first round. There are a couple of guys like that here this year, and Walter Rouse to an extent. Yeah. Kind of fits in that bucket in that, uh, you know, his years at Stanford were solid but unspectacular. And then this past year at Oklahoma uh, was very, very efficient. Yeah, sometimes you look for people who have had surgeries. I look for someone who can actually perform the surgery. Yeah. That's I think, they, I think you're going to put together one of the worst football teams of all time, <laughs> if that's the case. <laughs> Uh, all right, I'm gonna throw I'm gonna throw a few names at you. Here. Okay. Because yep. uh, uh, first, what, what I was sort of filtering by. Let's look at these uh, the profiles and then watch them, see how they move. One guy that I did really like was Garrett Greenfield from South Dakota State, six six three eleven. He's gonna be twenty four as a rookie, but um, tested very well, and I did like the way that, that he moved on the field. Tall, he's long, uh, good-looking kid from that standpoint. The athleticism Oof, like certainly, <laughs> sorry, the, the athleticism Much certainly stood out more. In, in, in Indianapolis. Uh, I would say, like on film, the the athleticism didn't always show okay. up. Um, but I think that when you, again, he's one of these guys that. You know, when you get into day three, uh, if a, if an offensive line coach loves him, uh, then I think you're going to see him kind of float up because he's got those traits. I don't think he will last long on day three. UCF's Tylen Grable, six six three zero six, another great broad jump. Yes, uh, high school quarterback. Yeah. So didn't play, and then showed up, and he was a tight end initially uh, at Jacksonville State, and so he played offensive lineman at Jacksonville State, moved to the O line there, then transferred to UCF and played there the last th uh, three se two seasons uh, with UCF. They moved to the Big Twelve this year, and like Rouse, this was his best year. So if you look, uh, you know, from uh, over the course of the body of his career. He would have been viewed as like a traits prospect where the film never really showed up. This past year uh, was his best. He goes to the combine and you know blows the doors off of every single work, uh, workout metric. Like Greenfield, I think it's just a matter of like he's got to tighten up a lot of things from a technical standpoint. But as we said earlier in the conversation, if that's your biggest issue, uh, then you feel like that can be correctable. And I think when you get to day three, that's the kind of shot you take. You talk about moldable balls of clay. 6'8", 353, Howard's Anim Dankwa. What a great name. 35 inch arms, uh, mm. so he's got he's got the length as well. Um, I feel like that's a good like uh, you're like, you're a, like a college pot dealer. Like I got that Dankwa. Anybody looking for that Dankwa? I got it. 
Yeah. Speaking from experience? No, but I think that's like... If you sell cookies to people? Yeah, yeah. 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 Insomnia cookies. Um, But no, Side order of Danqua. Yeah, look, you would know better than me uh, on that one. Um, He's got a strong... He's really strong. uh, And again, coming from Howard, lower level of competition, does he dominate that level of competition? Mm. I think at times you do see that uh, with Danqua. So um, most of his starts have come at left tackle, uh, but he has started at both guard spots as well. So you love that uh, position flexibility. uh, The size and the strength are are all there with Danqua. All right, the last one. Every day we come in to this office and Vince, dear Vince, (laughs) is talking to us. He's like, oh, well, that Yale kid. I Mm. like that Yale kid. Give me that Yale kid every single day. Vince, how you doing? I want that Yale kid. Yes. <laughs> Are you in on the Yale kid? I'm in on the Yale kid. Uh, so uh, Karan Amagaji. Nice Good job. Done. Karan Amagaji uh, from Yale. Um, Redshirt junior who declared for the draft. Uh, 36-inch long arm, so outstanding length. 6'5", 323 pounds. Uh, has only started 24 games in the Ivy League. So small sample at a lower level of competition, right? Uh Show the ability to dominate, and he is an outstanding athlete. What what kills me about Amagaji is that he had an injury midseason that that uh, ended his uh, this past year. So uh, he couldn't go to the Senior Bowl. Got invited, mm. couldn't go. Uh, did not work out at the combine. Uh, he ended up doing a, a workout. I think it was two weeks ago uh, th- during the the week of the owners' meetings. I believe he did a, a, pr- a private pro day up there, and so he got to he got a chance to work out. But you would have loved for him to be able to go like side by side with some of his peers, especially down at the senior bowl, you get to see him going up against a better level of competition. If he had done that and performed well, I think we're talking like day two all day uh, because the traits on film are really, really intriguing. Things to clean up, absolutely, but guys that are that big that move as well as he does on tape, they're very hard to find. And so that, that was what was most upsetting to me. It's like, man, like uh, I went to Indy not knowing if he was going to mm. be able to work out. And I was wondering, oh, like it would be, we couldn't see him in Mobile. But if you could see him go back to back to back with some of these other guys, you know, Joe, he would have been right next to Joe Alt in the workout because it's all alphabetical. To be able to see him go, like Joe Alt go and then see him go, like it would have been nice to be able to see that. Uh, obviously, we couldn't, but uh, the tape is really, really intriguing. And then we have to give a shout out to local players too. Uh, probably the top local off- offensive tackle. If we count Robbinsville local, uh, up up by Trenton, um, on, on your way to Princeton. Uh, Caden Wallace from Penn State. Right uh, next to Batmansville, right? <laughs> no, <laughs> but I see what you're doing there. I'm curious for Ant's take on him, but I'll just say Caden Wallace was a uh, you know starter at, at, at Penn State, tested well in the, in the broad jump and off the field. If, uh, <laughs> if it, you know, after football or football doesn't work out, he wants to run a Fortune 500 company. So, uh, off my board. <laughs> that's, that's right up Ke- Zach's board. <laughs> that's Caden Wallace for you. Yeah, I'm curious. I'm curious your thoughts on Caden Wallace. Uh, he is like the inverse of Walter Rouse in that he has played His only name is right Ross, tackle. Rouse Walter. <laughs> uh, Wallace, uh, Wallace Caden, uh, actually. Um, but I, when you look at Caden Wallace, he's been a right tackle only. Uh, the production and the, 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 the tape has just been okay uh, with him over the course oh, of so his career. Also, his left tackle is, is a top 15 pick. Oh, fashion, so, yes. Yeah. Um, so I, but, but in terms of like, all right, projecting yeah. him moving forward, it's always tough to say like, okay, well, this guy can come in and be a backup, but if he's only played right tackle sure. only. So this off season, uh, he was at the Shrine Bowl, uh, but you, you would like to see, okay, like, the, can you do more than play right tackle? Let's see left tackle reps. Can you play some guard? Uh, that's all stuff that he worked on, not just during the all-star game process, but then going to the private workouts and the, uh, certainly the pro day. Teams wanted to see, you know, does he have that ability to be able to slide inside or go over to the left side? I feel like there's a lot of people saying, oh, man, too much football talk in this episode. <laughs> this, is, this has been just too dense. It. This, for- has been, this is it's my, it's, it's taken us seven months for this kind of show. It's been <laughs> awesome. <laughs> We gotta feel like we gotta get some. How, some how, do you feel, how do you feel about the stories of Zach walking upstairs? What's your take on the? You know, I thought about weaving in like when I was talking about like power and strength, like you know, uh, power is like creating momentum, like Zach going up seven flights of steps. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I, I just couldn't, I couldn't connect the dots well enough. So I thought, you know, I'll just leave that on the cutting room floor. That's absurd. <laughs> it's absurd. I, I saw a commenter on iTunes saying that they had the same strategy. So kindred spirits in that regard. Did you li- did you do that from your phone or from yeah. your laptop? Yeah. Like, yeah. I did not post that. I I I, I would never do a uh, yeah a an anonymous comment like that. Never. No, you can't comment on yourself. You can't. That's <laughs> it's like photo, it's stuffing the ballots, if you will. You can't do that. I mean, you, well, you yeah. wouldn't vote for yourself if you were running for election? Well, that's a little different. I mean, okay. but yeah, I wouldn't give an anonymous iTunes comment about 
If you show. had to run for political office, what political office would you run for? Well, you have to work your way up. You can't just run for president right away. Oh. Just take the <laughs> Well, that, that, is wow. the, that is the furthest he has gone. Wow. That is the most he'll ever get out of him. <laughs> oh, um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, but wow. But, like, also, I mean, you would love to be Jed Bartlett one day, right? But um, uh, no, I'd rather be a human. I'd really rather be a real life human being. <laughs> but, no. Um, but no, I I I do want to say though, in terms of all, I I said the other day, um, I should apologize to our viewers. I was. I made the uh, the earthquake reference the other day. I mm. was I was kind of trying. I, I was saying it somewhat in jest. A YouTube commenter referenced uh, the horrible earthquake in India and kind of you know the uh, what has occurred there. Um, and so by no means was I trying to make light of earthquakes. Uh, I violated one of my main rules for the show, which is like don't speak about what you don't have education about. And so I I should just be I, I want to be forthright about that. Well, you did say like. If you had the like knowledge of knowing that it was a, a to be not safe, yeah, yeah. still, still, uh, yeah. Um, however, uh, the bank, the it was not in India; it was in Taiwan. If we're gonna just see, <laughs> sorry gonna, about that. Sorry, we're I, gonna worry I, about that. Sorry, I, I meant Taiwan. I, I, I meant Taiwan. I apologize. Yeah, I apologize. he's not gonna sleep for like three <laughs> days now. Yeah, I, 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 I apologize. I apologize. I think yeah. it, well, okay. okay. Uh, we, we, we don't. I want to end it on that. We got to <laughs> stick around. <laughs> tell, tell us about Jurassic Park. Oh, everyone wants to hear about oh, Jurassic Park. That's Jurassic right. Park went great. Yes. Kate, Kate, you know the scene where the guy gets the guy's uh, trying to hide from the T Rex and he gets eaten on the uh, classic on the toilet. It was like the funniest thing Casey ever seen. <laughs> he was laughing so hard, and then I'm laughing so hard, and Rachel's sitting there like, "What is wrong with these two men?" Like, <laughs> she's like scared, and we're she's seen the movie before. And, and so we were just like, when any time the T Rex was uh, terrorizing, we were just both laughing so hard. It worked out very well. It, yeah, I mean, he thought it was a comedy, essentially. Was, so. was there any moment where he kind of uh, like clenched? Uh, up a little you know, bit? it was uh, at the very end. You know, when like the, when the velociraptor, you know, they're hiding in the kitchen, yeah, and the velociraptors yep. are coming. It's not that he was scared; he was just more quiet. It was yeah. now it was also later at night, so he could have just been tired. But yeah. Uh, yeah, he was he was not traumatized by that at all. I remember the first time I watched it as a kid. So it, c- it came out. I mean, we were like third grade, fourth mm. grade ish, right? Uh, my dad went to the movies to see it first. Say like, all right, uh, is it good for the kids? Is it good for them to be able to see? Uh, and then we watched it. We waited for it to come out on tape. He bought it home, and we all watched it together. Uh, I remember the Dilophosaurus scene was the one that got where I was like, ooh, oh, like, uh, like early yeah. on when uh, when, uh, when Newman yeah. gets it. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's such a it's such a well made movie. Like they, even for kids, like you know, like the the lawyer is obviously you can tell not like not a good guy, so it's fine. And like the the pacing of it all, and it's I don't know, it's I thought it was really good. By far, I mean, it's the best of all well. of the the Jurassic Park movies. I mean, it's not oh, even, not even close. Not, not it's like that, that's, like, a, that's a film. The rest of them are just franchise BS. And they all, lo- they like look the best too, in my mm. opinion. I would agree. I w- or I would say. What's your pick tonight? <sighs> UConn. UConn, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You got, hey, you're you speaking Purdue? with your heart or your head there? I don't really have like an affinity I, for UConn oh, basketball. Okay, just yeah. UConn women's yeah, hockey. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm, I think, I think UConn, um, but I think Purdue's an awesome story after losing. Yeah, but that story's already been told, you know. Yeah, but still, I mean, I. I actually, I, 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 like, I, I think I, UConn's going to aesthetically. Win. I really do not enjoy watching Zach Eady play. I'm not taking anything away from him, yeah. like like the accolades, but like I do not enjoy watching him play college basketball. Okay, well, this is your last time you'll watch him play college basketball tonight. I think that's fine. But yeah, it's it should be a good game. Uh, you know that I, I think you know those two in Houston were the top teams all. All the way through, uh, some idiot picked Kentucky, Kentucky to win. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh yes, we're down. We're down to uh, the uh, the champion of our bracket. Uh, I'll, I'll pull it up in a second to see who the the two possible winners are. Zach, who do you think is going to get the Kentucky job? So I, I would watch out for Billy Donovan. Um, if, if he were to leave the NBA, that, that was always kind of Kentucky's dream hire. Um, you're hearing a lot about Nate Oates. Uh, Nate Oates is, is terrific. I mean, I, I actually did a deep dive on uh, you know, Nate Oates. And, well, I already knew a lot about Nate Oates. But um, actually, Michael Schwimmer, he used to play for the Phillies and kind of his involvement in the Alabama program. I, I was reading a few stories about that Saturday morning. Um, Alabama is an interesting program. Uh, what, what Nate Oates has done in Buffalo and Alabama is awesome. You hear the connections that uh, Barnhart, the AD, has to Scott Drew at Baylor. So you watch out there. Uh, but, I mean, I think that you have to call Billy Donovan, given 
what's going on with the Bulls this this season and uh, the fact that he's been the dream candidate at Kentucky. Looks like it's down to... Why, did it, why is this not updating now? <laughs> Adam P., if UConn wins, and... Alex A. Okay. If Purdue wins. And you'll have a spot on the show. Not permanently, but for <laughs> you can make an appearance. Yeah. 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 And, uh, you know, Zach will send you a picture of his feet. I will. That's a weird. I'm, <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, friend, what can uh, what can draft sickos look forward to uh, getting from you content wise leading into the draft? Yeah, so uh, you know, just follow me on Twitter uh, at EaglesXOs, and we'll uh, we'll continue to uh, to cover uh, in terms of like the the prospects of notes. Certainly, when the Eagles are making picks, we'll uh, I'll be posting some analysis on there. All right, looking forward to it. Thank you so much for coming in. Absolutely. Had a nice little breakfast ahead of time uh, around the corner. That was fun. Got to take a look at the studio. Good to see you. Beautiful. Love love being here. Appreciate it. All right. So for Fran and Zach, that'll do it for this episode of the PHLY Eagles podcast. Back tomorrow, talking edge rushers. We're going to have Deontay Lee joining us for a little bit, getting into the uh, the le- how, le- Leatau Latu. Leatu Latu. Leatu Latu. Yes. The Leatau. <laughs> Leatu, like Zach. Leatu Latu. Yeah, that is like me. The hymns of the world. (laughs) The L squares of the world uh, as we head into this draft. So uh, thanks, everybody, for watching and listening. We will talk to you tomorrow again at noon. And as always, we love you.